So let's see if we can look at this respectively. So before we officially begin with walking through um, walking through particularly the Anglican view of baptism, uh, how has been you guys' um, walkthrough in relation to your understanding of the doctrine of baptism? How have you guys thought of it? What do you mean by walkthrough? I mean, like, how, what's, what's been your, how has been your perspective on baptism? Has it grown? Have you always believed in a form of baptismal regeneration? Or was there a time that you believed it was only a sign? Or wh what has been your journey of understanding the doctrine of baptism? I've yeah. always thought it was regeneration, mm. but I never understood exactly what that meant to say it like that. You never so understood? My, under my understanding of it has grown in my life. Mm. Yeah, exact opposite for me. Oh, really? Yeah. I always take it as just a symbol, like, oh, it's a nice declaration of faith. It doesn't do anything. And then I was always told that, and then I, like, looked into church history and stuff, and I was like, yep, Zwingli was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you've got a point. Zwingli was uh, <clears throat> definitely wrong. But... <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's that's sort of what it what it was for me too. Um, I grew up a, a Zwinglian. I grew up um, thinking that baptism was just something that we did uh, for God. Um, but as you read Scripture, you figure out that that's not that that's not the case. Um, because I mean, Scripture is Scripture is quite clear on the doctrine of baptism that you are baptized for the washing away of sins you are engrafted into the family of god you are regenerated but i mean that of course begs the question what does regeneration mean and, and, and things of that nature so i mean like when i put it in my essay I, I said it like this we see in the new testament that god has given two sacraments to the church to give them the forgiveness of sins to unite them to christ and to unite them to one another. Christ instituted baptism in Matthew 28, 19, say, as a crucial part of making disciples of all the nations. Christ says, um, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, um, or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey that all I've commanded you. Uh, Peter, in a way that is similar to God's command to Abraham to circumcise, tells those who hear the gospel to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. We, here we see that baptism by God's command says that through it, our sins are forgiven. This sacrament is to be given to believers and their children, and as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Paul, speaking of baptism, ties it to our union with Christ and his death and resurrection in Romans chapter 6, verses 2 through 6. Peter says that baptism saves us in 1 Peter 3, 21. We are said to have put on Christ in baptism in Galatians chapter 3, verses 27 and 29. And because of our mutual union with Christ, all believers are united to one another. However, this blessed sacrament has brought division among believers when it should have brought unity, even with those within the Anglican communion. The main cause of division was on the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. For example, consider the birth of the Reformed Episcopal Church. The coming schism in 1873 invoked the, uh, provoking these pressing questions. What is baptism? What is, is it regeneration? And what happens in baptism? These questions and controversy, I believe, can be helped by observing the extra biblical doctrinal standards of the Anglican communion, that is, the Anglican formularies. In the 39 articles, especially the baptismal services of the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, we will see how the Anglican way defines baptism. 
So um, in relation to baptism, we, we've heard that it saves, that it gives regeneration. What exactly do you guys think uh, regeneration means? Nicholas, anyone? What do you guys think? Like, um, it's not like the water per se, it's just like the way the Holy Spirit is like, like used within it, I guess you would say. And the regeneration means like being part of like, um, born again, I would say, just, just a simplistic way. Sure, sure. Participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Um, well, that's true, yeah. Being, yeah. you know, re being renewed and having, yeah, new, new birth, like he was saying. And how do you think that relates to the doctrine of sacraments? Uh, do the sacraments have that sort of power in and of themselves? Or how, how does how does the work of the Holy Spirit relate to your doctrine of the sacraments? I would say faith, like faith. It's, a, it's an act of faith. Mm -hmm. An act of your faith? Or so, so it's only effective because you have faith? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's a work that God gives us. <laughs> yeah, that's that's um that's some really interesting perspectives. So, like, I I, I put this in my essay in this way, and I, I want to contrast the the Anglican perspective to sort of like the the perspective that they're arguing against, the the claims of of Rome. So, uh, let me see. Let's look at the definition that it's argued for in the Council of Trent. According to Trent, full forgiveness of original sin, where all stain of forgiveness of sin is washed away, regeneration and justification are given at the moment of baptism. And so in Roman Catholic theology, the emphasis is on the institution of the sacrament itself. It works ex opera operato. What does that mean? Ex opera operato means by the working it is worked. Though faith and repentance in the case of an infant is supposed to be supplied by the parents and godparents, the emphasis of the sacrament, where its efficacy is, is not found within the faith of the individual, the work of the Holy Spirit, but primarily in the simple valid working of the baptism. But all of the reformers taught against this notion of the sacraments basically working like a machine that is independent of vicarious faith of either the congregation or the adults themselves. And so the Protestant reformer and the primary author of the prayer book, Thomas Cranmer, did not take this view. In his theology of the sacraments, he actually used Augustine's language of the sign and the thing signified. A sacrament is a sign that conveys by the Holy Spirit a thing signified, an eternal truth or an eternal reality. In his defense of the true and Catholic doctrine of the Lord's Supper, he defines baptism as the working of the Holy Spirit, not physical water. He says, this baptism and washing by fire and the Holy Ghost, this new birth, this water that springs in a man and flows into everlasting life, and this clothing and burial cannot be understood of any material baptism, material washing, material birth, clothing and burial, but by translation of things visible into things invisible, they must be understood spiritually and figuratively. Here, Thomas Cranmer tells us that the spiritual efficacy of baptism is not to be found merely in the physical water, but in the power of the Holy Spirit. For Thomas Cranmer, God works within the sacrament, or more specifically, in the person receiving the sacrament through faith. Faith enables the receiver to see the spiritual reality in the physical sign and receive the grace given in the sacrament. Faith is central to Cranmer's baptismal theology. And so we, we see his theology of baptism that and his theology of the sacraments that god propo uh, proposes and works within the sacrament to give an objective reality and that objective reality is received and fully realized in the person where there is true and living faith however the full definition of what cranmer means 
by regeneration is a bit hard to discern. But as we see in relation to the rest of the Anglican reformers and the, the Anglican thought, regeneration is actually a little bit different to how most continental reformers, well, not necessarily the continental reformed, but uh, followers of the continental reformed view generation, view regeneration. You see, as the right Reverend Ray Sutton notes, the Anglicans, Anglican reformers viewed regeneration as an organic relationship with God. It was a change in relationship, a movement from one sphere to the other. What it was not was a moral transformation or what we would call conversion. It's not how we would technically be called being born again, or what we would call in this day and age being born again. He says, quote, it was the seed of the word of God planted at baptism, but in need of cultivation to grow. It was not mechanical nor automatic. Regeneration was not understood as the conception of the spirit. Analogous to physical birth, it was the new birth into the kingdom of God, a transfer from one system or one sphere to the other. To say that one was regenerated at baptism meant that God had adopted the person into the kingdom and that he had begun a work of grace through baptism, albeit not the completion of grace. In regeneration, God plants the seed of new life in the individual, their sins are forgiven, and God places them on the path of entering into the eschatological kingdom. So what do you think about this view of regeneration so far? Do you think I need to go a little bit deeper into it? Um, how, what are your guys' uh, impressions on this definition of the Anglican view of regeneration so far? Okay, so what you're pretty much saying right now is just entering into the, the new covenant? Uh, sort much. of. It's entering into a brand new relationship with God. Your sins are forgiven as in you, the, it's not that the entire presence of original sin is completely taken away with, but the power of, of original sin is broken within you. Sin is crushed within you, as Calvin would say, um, and that you're entering into a new and real covenant relationship with God where the seed of regeneration or the seed of sanctification is placed within you, but it needs to be cultivated. It needs to be cultivated. Um, Nicholas, what, what are what are your thoughts? I agree. I don't think I explained it good enough, but also like I'm kind of more newer to that view. So I'm kind of like still also learning at the same time. Mm. Of course. I mean, I w what I would ask is the same thing, I guess, um, Andrew asked, like, how would that be? different than like a, a catholic to say perspective well I, I wouldn't well the catholic view would be that something works automatically and there's a lot more to it and the roman catholic view as we saw that your sins are completely like original sin completely washed away concupiscence okay. concupiscence yeah. in relation to um the inclination to sin is not sin anymore it's not considered sin anymore but that's not that's not the reformed view. It's not the reformed view. Yeah. But yeah, original, yeah, it's not completely done away with. It's broken to where the Holy Spirit can actually begin to to fully work within you and and work out a moral transformation. Your slavery to sin is broken, but that doesn't mean you're completely sinless. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah, so so this this actually. Andrew asked a very good question. Um, how does that relate to the historic um, definitions of baptismal regeneration in relation to the, um, the early church? And so Ray Sutton actually walks through this in his, uh, in his book, Signed, Sealed, and Delivered. On page 98, uh, he talks about the, the early church definition. In the history of Christianity, there have generally been four definitions of the word regeneration. They reflect different theological concerns at various times in the history of the church. Some of these doctrinal preoccupations define the word so that it means something very different from its original intent. First, in the early church, regeneration simply meant baptism. 
According to Edward Harold Brown, the fathers originally called the sacraments themselves by the name of the grace of the sacraments. Thus, baptism is perpetually called regeneration or illumination. Not the sacrament of regeneration, but simply regeneration. He goes on to cite many church fathers, such as Irenaeus, Tertullian, Cyprian, and so forth. For example, he notes Irenaeus' comments where the church father refers to baptism, which is regeneration to God. And elsewhere, speaking of how Jesus committing his disciples, committing to his disciples the power of regeneration, he said to them, go ye and teach all nations, baptizing them. Beyond this basic understanding of baptism as regeneration, there was a very full and rich interpretation of the sacrament in the early church period. The first sacrament informed their understanding of spirituality, which we'll consider later in chapter 8. But for the moment, however, it is important to note the early church tendency to call baptism regeneration based on the straightforward language of the New Testament. It is only until the scholastic period that we see regeneration as described as an infused habit of grace. An infused habit of grace. Um, let's see, this meant something approaching the renovation of the whole inner man. Richard Hooker uh, believed in something close to this, so this um, close to this habit of grace concept. Even the reformed theologian of the 17th century, Francis Turretin, retained elements of this medieval categories by reference to his language. The difficulty with the habit of grace interpretation was the way in which it was combined with a mechanical view of the sacraments. But in relation to the English reformers, the reformers view of regeneration associated with baptism, but distinguished it from the converting work of the Holy Spirit. In general, they distinguished grace from substance regarding the sacraments. They saw grace as the mysterious work of God, although the majority of them did not separate this action of God from the sacrament. They spoke of the sacraments as means of grace, but not the grace in and of itself. For this reason, they understood regeneration as a covenant change relation, adoption as children, and the first working of grace. Some of the continental reformers and the English reformers, however, were divided over how this first working of grace would viewed, was viewed, which really had to do with their understanding of grace. The English reformers, strongly influenced by Augustine, thought of grace as more organic. It was the seed of the word of God planted at baptism, but it was in need of cultivation. It was not mechanical nor automatic. The famous German reformer, Martin Bucer, uniquely conveyed this organic emphasis into the baptismal office of the Book of Common Prayer with the word regeneration in a biblical and reformational baptismal service, which he had written for the Archbishop of Cologne. Recognizing the significance of this work, Thomas Cranmer invited Bootser to come to Cambridge, where he finished his life and career. So basically, it's Martin Bootser's interpretation of regeneration that is placed into the Book of Common Prayer. And he saw baptism as regeneration. So re regeneration was not understood as the, um, as the conception of the spirit analogous to physical births, as we, as, as we said earlier. Bootser and the English reformers were careful to distinguish the work of the Spirit from the substance of water. They referred to verses such as Titus 3.5, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, to support a view that the washing, baptism, was a different action from the renewal of the Holy Spirit. The two could work or could take place at the exact same time, but also they might not. The work of the Holy Spirit is like the wind, according to John 3a, blowing where he wills. According to Bootser and a majority of the reformers, therefore, a new covenant relationship with God and his people was truly established at baptism. Moreover, this new relation with God by grace needed to be nurtured with growing faith. Final salvation was not automatic if the person did not persevere. Taken as a whole, this view was very different from the mechanical late medieval view of salvation. So what, what do you guys think of that so far? Or do you want me to sort of um, summarize it for you? Yeah, summarize it. So 
the English view, and of course, Bootser's view, which was the general continental reform view, was that regeneration is distinct from conversion, what we would call the effectual calling, the effectual calling. The effectual call can happen at any time, can happen at any time. It can happen before the institution of baptism for an adult. It can happen afterwards, after a baptism, or where it usually happens, it usually happens within, uh, within baptism. But that's not mainly what baptism does. The baptism itself is not the effectual call. Baptism places you in a new relationship with God. It places you within God's covenant. It places the seed of God's grace within the sacrament. It, it's, it causes the seed of grace to go within you. But that needs to be cultivated. And that is cultivated by, of course, the renewing of the Holy Spirit in relation to Titus 3. Um, so that that's the, that's the distinction that we would find in relation to the reformers and as I believe is found in the church fathers. If you wanna look at that um, in depth, uh, after, after the presentation, we can literally, we can walk through um, chapter eight of Signed, Sealed and Delivered uh, to see how um, both uh, Brown in his commentary on the 39 articles and um, uh, Ray Sutton uh, views the relationship of the early church uh, to the fathers. Um, I mean, the view of the early church to the Anglican uh, reformers. I believe that they are consistent in saying that the church fathers agree with them. It's not in disagreement to the early fathers. Uh, but Nick, did, did that summary help you? Yeah, 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 it helped. Nice, nice. So with, with that definition of regeneration taking place, um, Let's let's look at the uh, yeah we'll we'll look at this we'll look at this because we see that baptism as we have seen from the perspective of the early fathers is not the end of the Christian life it doesn't entail full salvation it doesn't entail final salvation um, but it's it's the start of the Christian life not its end nor its completion um, and we'll see that in the articles of religion and in the prayer book. So uh, let's see, Nick, do you have the 39 articles with you? Um, do you mean the 2019? Or do you mean yeah. like separate? No, I mean like the 39 articles, you can look at it in the 2019, it'll, it'll be the same. Yeah. Yeah, so can you read the first, uh, first paragraph of article 25 of the sacraments? What page that would be? Uh, 781. Of the sacraments, sacraments ordained of Christ be not only badges or tokens of Christian men's professions, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's good will, will towards us by the which he doth work invisibly in us, and doth not only quicken, but also strengthen and confirm our faith in him. Awesome. Now, can you also read Article 27, which is found on 782, uh, just, the, just the whole article, article, on, article 27 on baptism? Baptism is not only a sign of profession and mark of difference, whereby Christian men are discerned from others that be not christened, but it is also a sign of regeneration or new birth, whereby, as an instrument, they receive baptism rightly, are grafted into the church the promises of forgiveness of sin and of adoption to be the sons of God by the Holy Ghost, and visibly signed and sealed, faith is confirmed and grace increased by virtue of prayer unto God. The baptism of young children is in any wise to be retained in the church as most agreeable with the institution of Christ. Awesome. So we see here that according to the articles, the Father works invisibly by the Holy Spirit and those receiving baptism. It is also an outward invisible declaration as well as a badge of our belonging to God. 
baptism points out to us the new birth and it is the means by which God places a person into his covenant family. We truly are his family. It's where he forgives us of our sins. It's where he adopts us and where he communicates grace to us and strengthens our faith in him. It forgives original sin, though not its stain, as we see in Article 10, as it is referred to in Article 10, even the sacrament, even in the sacrament, there is an emphasis on repentance and faith, heralded, heralded in Article 11 on justification, justification by faith alone. And one must not forget the emphasis on God's freedom to move, as is referenced in Article 17 on predestination. Author and priest Peter Toon notes on this point, baptism according to the articles is, quote, a divinely appointed entry into a right relationship with God, the spiritual washing of the soul, and the beginning of the Christian life. This is why baptism is generally necessary for salvation. A person can be saved without baptism, but the general path into living a right relationship with God is through the waters of baptism. This is why even Paul, when he's converted, is asked, um, uh, what, what is stopping you? Be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. When the people are pricked in the heart in Acts chapter 2, Peter tells them, uh, when, he, when he's asked, men and brothers, what shall we do? The command is, go and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, for the promises for you and for your children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. There is a real relationship that is being established in baptism. Real sins are being forgiven, and a real washing is taking place by the, by the work of the Holy Spirit. Something is being placed in you by the work of the Holy Spirit and not merely by the work of the water. What you need is faith in order to make that seed grow. So we, we see this particularly in the 1552 and 1662 prayer book. It is argued that the 1562, 1552, which the 1662 prayer book is based off of, is more Protestant than the 1549. I disagree. Though the 1552 rite is simpler in all that it in, in that the everything in relation to the to the sacrament happens inside the church. Um, by that, I mean when you look at the liturgy between the 1549 and the 15, 1552. Uh, the sacrament of baptism was split into two parts. One at the beginning, at the at the outside of the church, at the doors of the church where the font was, and then you moved into the church after the institution of baptism. But in the 1552, the parts that were that were put at the beginning of the church were placed into the church. They were placed into the church. But nevertheless. It's not different in substance. The 1549 and the 1552 prayer book demonstrate the same baptismal theology, that baptism remits sins, it obtains incorporation into the church, and grace for ones who rightly deceive, receive it, and it regenerates them. This theme occurs from the very exhortation, very first exhortation of the service. So do you guys have your 1552 or 1662, pardon me, uh, service book in front of you. The PDF. Yeah. So, so do you guys have it on the ministration of the public baptism of infants to be used in the church? No. What, what page is that? Um. Uh, well, if it's if, if it's on the full PDF, I have no idea. I'm looking at it from the uh, the Church of England website. So there, you could actually look at the, the table of contents for it. But nevertheless, I'll, re I'll read it for us. Um, here is the first prayer or the first exhortation that is used for it. Um, the exhortation reads, Dearly beloved, for as much as all men are conceived and born in sin, and that our Savior Christ has... Uh, has said, 
none can enter into the kingdom of God except he be regenerate and born anew of water and the Holy Ghost. I beseech you to call upon God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, that of his bounteous mercy he will grant to his child that thing which by nature he cannot have, that he may be baptized with water and the Holy Ghost and received into Christ's holy church and be made a lively member of the same. So what do you guys think of this introductory exhortation? Logos, what do you think? I'm still trying to get it like um, fleshed out of my head. Um, sure, you want me to read it for you? No, no, no. I, 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 I understand it. I'm just trying to get it like sorted out, like clear in my head. How can I help you? Especially when it comes to, um, I'm also thinking about um, order, mm -hmm. like order of baptism, like like the order of. But we would okay. I'm I'm trying to not use only Protestant terms. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Um, when Throw you become up, saved, you know, order, order of salute um, or, or things of that nature. Yeah, like the order of it. Okay, especially like when it comes to baptism, pedo baptism. If you're baptism baptized as an adult, mm -hmm. um, salvation when it starts and signed seal what's a sign and seal are you signed and sealed can you be signed and sealed as a baby like I'm, I'm trying to order this all in my head a little bit right right and of course as we're walking through the baptismal service the the anglicans say yes it happens <laughs> you can be signed and sealed when you're an infant and the question is why and we see this at the very beginning of this exhortation um Nicholas, are you are you looking at the exhortation or uh, do you want me to read it again? Because I, I want you to see what I believe we're seeing. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably need to read that again. Sure, sure. <laughs> the, the exhortation says, Dearly beloved, for as much as all men are conceived and born in sin, and that our Savior Christ saith, none can enter into the kingdom of God except he be regenerate and born anew of water and the Holy Ghost. I beseech you, the audience, to call upon God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, that of his bounteous mercy he will grant to this child the thing which by nature he cannot have, that he may be baptized with water and the Holy Ghost and received into Christ's holy church and be made a lively member of the same. So what are some of the things that stick out to you from this exhortation? Um, I don't, I don't really see anything that I, you know, like anything different that I would. Sure. So, so here, here are two things that, that strike out to me that, that are important, that are important for us to know. Number one, the liturgy or the exhortation presupposes that the persons who are bat that are being baptized need to be cleansed from original sin. They need to be cleansed from original sin. Because it says all men are conceived and born in sin. And the necessary remedy for that, as Christ says, is being regenerate and being born anew of the water and the spirit. We also see that this is something that which we, by nature, cannot have. That means that we are clinging to the mercy of God. And so for Cranmer, when it comes to an infant, how is he going to receive that grace? How is he going to receive that grace? The answer is the faith of the congregation. The faith of the congregation. For an adult, it's his own faith, which is worked into him by God. But for the infant, since he cannot have adult faith, it is the faith of the congregation, the faith of his sponsors. This is why in the beginning... It says in the rubric, for every child to be baptized, there should be no fewer than three godparents, of whom at least two shall be of the same sex as the child, 
and whom at least one shall be the opposite sex. Save that when three cannot conveniently be had, one godfather and one godmother shall suffice. The parents may be godparents for their own child, provided that the child shall have, least, have at least one other godparent. The godparent shall be persons who have been baptized and confirmed, and will faithfully fulfill their promises both by their care for the child committed to their charge, and by the example of their own godly living. So, baptism for an infant requires godparents, so that their faith might be vicariously given to God on behalf of the child. Do you guys know any instance in scripture where we even find a basis for godparents in relation to this? Wouldn't it be an axe? No, not necessarily. It doesn't specifically deal with baptism, but it does deal with something like the faith of people taught, um, the, the faith of others being accepted by God on behalf of someone else. Which passage would you be referring to? What, are you talking about like like story of Noah, maybe? No, no, it, it's a it's a story of Jesus. I'm referring to the story of the paralytic. I'm referring to the story of the paralytic. You guys know the story of the paralytic, right? Where mm -hmm. the, the man yep. is is lame and he can't he can't come in where Jesus is teaching, and so what his friends do is that they they tear a hole in the house. And they lower the paralytic down. And what does what does scripture say? When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, my child, your sins are forgiven. He was healed based upon the faith of his friends. Does it mean that there was no possibility of the paralytic having faith? The text doesn't say. But what it does say is that Christ, in his good will, gives grace to this friend because of the faith of his other friends, by the faith of his sponsors. So in the exact same way, Christians have always acted in faith by appealing to God, to God's good will, on behalf of their professed faith to give grace to this child. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Yeah. It does. Now I was thinking about I was thinking about Noah, like how, you know, they he, God picked out Noah, but his family was saved based off of Noah. Yes. Very, based on, you know? Yes, exactly. Of Noah's faith. You're you're exactly right there. So so this is this is one of the emphases. This is one of the emphases here. Because um, the congregation is asked to, to call upon God to wash, sanctify, and make the child a living member among them. After that, after that comes one of the most beautiful prayers I've ever seen in the prayer book. <laughs> one of the most beautiful prayers. This is what's called the flood prayer. It's, it's what's called the flood prayer. This is what it said. Almighty and everlasting God who of thy great mercy did save Noah and his family in the ark from perishing by water. You're exactly right, Logos. And also did safely lead the children of Israel, thy people, through the wet Red Sea, figuring thereby holy baptism. And by the baptism of thy well-beloved son, Jesus Christ, in the river Jordan, did sanctify water to the mystical washing away of sin. We beseech thee for, thy, for thine infinite mercies, that thou wilt look mercifully look upon this child, wash him and sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, that he, being delivered from your wrath, may be received into the ark of Christ's church, and being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, rooted in charity, may so pass the waves of this naughty world, <laughs> that he may come to the land of everlasting life, there to reign with thee, world without end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So here this text says that God saved Noah and his family through water. God led the children of Israel through water, prefiguring holy baptism. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But we also see the baptism of Jesus 
sanctifying water to the mystical washing away of sin. This goes back to Irenaeus's statement that Christ was baptized so that he might purify water. In fact, he says he purifies all water so that all water might be used, not just holy water, to be used for baptism. Thoughts? Uh, I'm just thinking, I think an STS needs to baptize babies too. <laughs> <laughs> We'll get to the good reason for infant baptism in a little bit, and the the, the biblical reason. Um, the, the whole godparents thing—I've never heard that before. Oh yeah, this is why godparents has been an ancient practice in the church, um, and this is why it calls upon the the faith of the congregation. We are the ones praying to God. We beseech, we beseech thee, we beseech God that he might do as he said he would do that he would that he would um, deliver this man from the wrath of deliver this child from the wrath of God sanctify him with the holy ghost set him apart mercifully look upon him look upon him with mercy be received into the ark of Christ church do you guys know that there is a reason why churches are structured in the way that they are like for most anglican churches and most catholic and orthodox churches they're structured like a ship because the church is the ark of Christ's salvation. That's why. And so when we are baptized, we are placed within the ark of the church. You're there. And so that being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, rooted in charity, he might pass the ways of this naughty and troublesome world and may come to the land of everlasting life. It's not, it's, it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. It's, it's structured through faith, hope, and love. They will receive this by communing with Christ. And this is what we pray for, that God will do as he promised that he would do. We then come to the seeking prayer immediately after this. This is the seeking prayer. Almighty and immortal God, the aid of all that, uh, that need, the helper of all that flee to thee for succor, the life of them that believe and the resurrection of the dead, we call upon thee for this infant, that he, coming to the holy baptism, may receive remission of sins by spiritual regeneration. Receive him, Lord, as thou hast promised by thy well-beloved Son, saying, Ask, and ye shall have. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. So give now unto us that ask, let us that seek find, open the gate to us that knock, that this infant might enjoy the everlasting benediction of thy heavenly washing, and may come to the eternal kingdom which thou hast promised by Christ our Lord. Amen. So what do you guys think of this prayer uh, so far? Well, the, the, the seeking prayer. That's good, but hashtag monergism. <laughs> that, that's the point. That, that, that really is it. We are relying upon the sovereign grace of God to do as he said that he's going to do. And we believe with confidence that God will do is what he said he's going to do. Hmm. Um, he said, uh, so sanctify. You said, I still struggle with the baptism doctrine. Could you Could you define what you mean a little bit more? I, th I, I don't know yeah. what he's going to say, but I think he probably struggles with uh, the dichotomy and like the church fathers in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. No, I struggle with the historicity because it does, based on some of the early church fathers, like at the earliest point, mm -hmm. um, a lot of what they taught also lined up with both pedo baptism and credo baptism. Some of them taught straight fourth credo like rejected pedo and others rejected credo um and also just the fact that like i understand that it's a mirror of circumcision 
Yeah. But I don't think baptism applies, like, at least from what I'm convinced so far, in the same way that circumcision was about physical birth and physical lineage, that baptism, it seems, does parallel circumcision, but in the sense of the spiritual rebirth, the spiritual um, identity that you become affiliated with as the people of God, you know? Right. So it's a right so it'd be like being a spiritual babe not necessarily a, f a physical babe in christ you know so so when you when you describe and we'll we'll definitely get to this because we're actually at the point of what is the base um the base reason for why anglicans uh baptize their infants um uh as as we'll see in the gospel reading uh which which comes immediately after this um, but could, be, before we do that, could you could you explain your per, your I guess understanding of church history in relation to I guess some people automatically denying infant baptism because uh, historically the only person that I could that I could see is Tertullian and it's not primarily because he argues like a like a Baptist saying that this should only be done um, uh, as someone who professes faith. But he does right. it because he believe, he places, I, I would even argue, not enough power. He has a very low view of baptism to where baptism only washes uh, sins from the time that it's instituted. And therefore, you, right. you, need, to do a, you, you need to do it at the end of your life. Uh, that's, that's how he would say it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't even necessarily call him a credo-baptist uh, by, by that definition, because even the credo-baptist would say, no, when whenever you whenever you profess faith, but Tertullian puts it at the end of one's life. So yeah, he's a he's, like, a, he's a grandpa see. Baptist. Right. So historically, like from what I've examined from like the letters and the writings of them, um, Tertullian, yes, he was definitely one where he believed that faith was instrumental in the sense of like that someone that was baptized as an infant, he actually viewed it as invalid because they can't profess faith. And some of his writings, he went that far to say it. And so did um, Justin Martyr, as did Irenaeus, and the Didache, even. Where does the... I have a doc with a bunch of the quotes. Um, I don't have it on me right now. Um, yeah. It's, a, it's on my computer, or else I would love to just send you the quotations. And I'd be curious if you'd want to look it over, because I'm willing to wrestle with this. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. Like, the I Didache... Have, yeah. I would agree with that because I've read all those things too, but I don't think yeah. that's, I think it's more nuanced with some of the fathers than it is with the others. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, I, think in the mind. I find it, I find it quite spurious to say that the Didache um, denies such thing of such thing in relation to infant faith. I think like reading the Didache, that'd be an argument from silence, but that would be a, that would be a great, um, a great stream to have. Uh, probably, uh, probably next week if we wanna if we wanna do it that time. But yeah, like so. An example: the Didache specifically says, prior to baptism, it it actually says it's required to go through a time of fasting, of prayer, of examination, and so on and so forth. And so infants, they just they can't do that. You know, it says. Yeah, but, is that, but is that talking about for an adult, or is that talking about for an infant? Right, because the, the, the manual in and of itself is mainly for growing churches, uh, growing churches in the uh, beginning of the first century where most people are not having covenant children. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the text is the text doesn't does it flow into what we generally see at the close of the New Testament where churches are fully established, where churches are fully established. Um, mm -hmm. But as we see in relation to people, like like people have even argued that Polycarp was uh, was baptized as an infant. Um, that uh, it, it even origin notes uh, that from the tenderest age, people are coming to baptism. Uh, I believe it's Irenaeus too, or Ignatius, that that these people are coming to uh, coming to the font of baptism and being regenerated from the. Uh, from the earliest age, from the tenderest age, um, but we can we can we can talk about that in relation to um, church history right. in depth. Uh, probably, and yeah, this isn't me denying. 
Yeah, this isn't me denying that pedo baptism isn't early either. I would say, like, that was very much they were kind of alongside one another teaching wise at the earliest point, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, pedo baptism sure. definitely won. They got the vast majority, and eventually that became the the view of the church, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, like, in, in relation to, like, I honestly think that this is, um, when people say infant baptism versus credo baptism, um, I think the argument is a bit skewed because mm -hmm. baptism in relation to the pedo-baptist view is just plain baptism because we baptize mm -hmm. adults and we baptize infants. Right. So, so to it, it's only the credo Baptist, I believe, that is being incredibly exclu exclusive to the to the practice of the church, um, mm -hmm. and we see in relation to like uh, Baptists trying to argue uh, historically for their position, they don't find mm -hmm. it until 1609, and that's even like nine years after uh, the first Baptist apparently appeared on the scene, uh, John Smith. Um, mm -hmm. And he didn't start uh, not baptizing babies until 1609. And it was after uh -huh. 1609 when he stopped baptizing babies that the, um, uh, what is it, that the pilgrims separated from him because they said, yo, you, you're going way too far with this. Uh, uh -huh. you're, you're leaving the ancient practice of the church. So, I, I mean, uh, hi historically, I don't, I don't think that there's a, a full full explanation or a full position for the credo baptist until uh until 1609 right um but then we can we can go back to the theology of bat of of circumcision and its relationship to baptism um, right right as as, as paul says more. yeah yeah paul says that circumcision is not just physical that circumcision is spiritual right uh, because he he says in romans chapter 4 for uh 4 uh 11 that that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a mm -hmm. seal of the righteousness that he had by faith before he was circumcised. Right. So circumcision is a spiritual sign and seal of a spiritual reality. It's mm -hmm. not primarily about physical land promises. It's about believing and affirming the gospel preached to him. Right, but it did. Ha it was identified with someone's physical physical birth, though. Because they weren't spiritually reborn yet at that time. Well, it, it could happen at both. It, it could happen both at the time of the institution or before the sign of the institution or afterwards. Like, like for example, um, a, a, an infant can be circumcised and he can be a believer since, since that time. Or when it comes, comes to a, uh, a Gentile and he wanted to become a Jew, he's, he's regenerated. And after that, he circumcised him and his whole household. Uh, and there are even times where people are circumcised and then they come to faith later on. Uh, so so it, it's, it's just in the exact same way in the pattern of circumcision that it is with baptism. The, the, it is generally accepted that the sign of the thing signified are united at the institution. But there are times when God can work outside of the institution of the sacrament. Does that make sense? Also? Yeah, he's not he's not bound by the sacraments. That's what. Right, right, right. And and Amen. I would I would agree that it's both physical and spiritual, even with circumcision. Yeah, good, good. Because they are be considered holy and set apart for God's purposes, and at the same time, they're being physically identified with their faith as a nation. And I, as far I, as these I, church father quotes go that you're speaking about, like, you know, um, that seem to talk about um, credo baptism. Um, mm -hmm. I've read a lot of those quotes, too, because, like, this kind of interested me a while back, too. And yeah. um, I would argue that some of those quotes are not um, black and white, like they're contrasting credo and pedo baptism, but they're specifically speaking for uh, an adult. So it's not necessarily a contrast between the two. You know what I mean? Right. I, um, I would say, like from what we've from what we've just discussed, our, your view of circumcision and my view of baptism are exactly the same. And so uh -huh. the, the the arguments for credo baptism are the exact same arguments for, um, well, the 
the arguments for infant baptism are the same arguments for infant circumcision. So uh -huh. I, that's, I mean, we're, I think we're in agreement there. I don't think you have uh -huh. a biblical or theological objection to, in, to infant baptism, to be honest with you. And in fact, as we'll see later in the gospel reading, um, well, now in the gospel reading, right. <laughs> this, this is, um, this is Cranmer's main emphasis, um, as in the goodwill of God towards infants. Um, and that's the main motivation for infant baptism in, in his view. Um, so let, we'll, we'll look at the, we'll look at the gospel reading. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Nick, could you, could you, well, I already, I already have it here, but do you, do you have the liturgy in front of you? Which page? I don't worry. I'll take care of it because oh, I, I, I wouldn't know which page it would be. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's fun. So, so here it's it's only three verses. Um, this is wow. In the in in the ancient view, everyone would stand. Well, of course, it's this way too. Everyone would stand for the gospel reading. So the gospel reading is uh, Mark chapter ten, uh, beginning at verse 13, 13 through sixteen. It says they brought young children to Christ that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was very displeased and said to them, Suffer the little children to come to me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say to you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So here, after that, we, we see the exhortation and the small sermon that comes from the reading of the gospel. It says, Beloved, hear ye, or you hear in the gospel, the words of our Savior Christ, that he commanded the children to be brought unto him, how he blamed those who would have kept them from him, how he exhorts all men to follow their innocency, you, per you perceive how by this outward gesture and the deed he declared his good deed, his good will towards them. For he embraced them in his arms. He laid his hands upon them and he blessed them. Doubt you not, therefore, but earnestly believe that he will likewise favorably receive this present infant, that he will embrace him with the arms of his mercy that he will give unto him the blessing of eternal life and make him a partaker of his everlasting kingdom. Wherefore, we being thus persuaded of the good will of our heavenly father towards this infant, declared by his son Jesus Christ and not doubting, but that he favorably allows his charitable work of ours in bringing this infant to his holy baptism, let us faithfully and devoutly give thanks to him. So, what do you guys think of this uh, this explanation of the gospel reading? I mean, I've used that to argue the position. <laughs> and you'd be right. <laughs> Thank you, Father. What do you think? Hmm. I don't, I, I just, I don't know. Like, I'm okay with children getting baptized, but I think it's once they have that faith, because I, re I really don't think there's any purifying, any washing without that faith. So mm -hmm. baptism's kind of purposeless until they have some sort of profession. Well, it's funny because after this comes the profession of faith. So, so, and, and Cranmer would agree with you. That uh -huh. no walking happens without the presence of faith, but uh -huh. we've been but we've been talking this entire time that somebody else is present with the infant. Right, right, and I've understood that view. I used to be Roman Catholic, and they kind of taught similar. Yeah. Right, right, and 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 of course they have the presence of God, parents, but the 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 real emphasis is within the working of the sacrament, and and not necessarily faith itself and not vicarious faith. Here, 
And here we have the actual emphasis of vicarious faith and the work of the Holy Spirit. Because the, the, what the Holy Spirit does is that through the washing of the water, he projects the gospel out to us. But it is only faith that receives such thing. And it is the faith of the godparents on behalf of the child that the Holy Spirit sees, that God the Father sees, and that the Son sees. Right. And it acts within the child. So, so as we saw in relation to um, both Mark and in Luke, the we, God is looking for faith. So when we I, say distinction uh, of identifying the child as being a, a member of the church, a member of the congregation, as in they're part of that community, that's who their parents are, their grandparents are, or their godparents are, it's on so versus the baptismal waters that's actually washing them of iniquity. Would there be that distinction then? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's, it's not the water that does anything. It's the Holy Spirit working right. within right. the water. So, so yeah, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, it's the Holy Spirit working in present faith to give what he, what, what he promises. And he uses visible means in order to convey that. Mm -hmm. So here he, like, like, for example, um, here Cranmer's foundation, here is Cranmer's foundation for infant baptism, the goodwill of Christ. Instead of rooting his reasons in covenant theology like the Reformed churches, and, and to note, he does use it as a defense for infant baptism, but that's not the main emphasis. The mm -hmm. good will of Christ on behalf of faith is the main reason for baptizing infants and his love for, for infants themselves. Mm -hmm. Infants serve as the model for entering the kingdom. Christ uh -huh. receives the child in his own love. And baptism is the way for us to bring our infants to Christ. And it is the means by which Christ receives them into his family. Mm -hmm. as, as we'll see later on, during this and during the baptism, the priest symbolizes Christ receiving the child by the priest taking him in his taking the child in his arms and holding him. This primarily reflects, quote, a response to the action of Christ. We trust in the promise of Christ that this child is regenerate. The sacramental sign of this is that the child is received not only into Christ, but into the church. Mm -hmm. And this, this is, is resulted in the presence of faith within the following prayer of the prayer of thanksgiving and the confession of faith. So, so, yeah, so with an infant, we're just real quick. I have one last question. Sure. So when would that, uh, that like covenant promise of like baptism, of them engaging that as an infant, when would they actually be sealed with that promise, like effectively? Would that be after they have their own conscious faith or? Uh, pretty, well, pretty much. We'll, we'll see. We'll see some of this um, a little bit later. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to spoil anything for okay. you. Okay. <laughs> we'll yeah. we'll we'll walk through this. We'll walk through this together. All right. So so here we have here we have the prayer after the exhortation. Almighty and everlasting God, heavenly Father, we give thee humble thanks that thou hast vouchsafed to call us to the knowledge of thy grace and faith in thee. Increase this knowledge and confirm this faith in us forevermore. Give your Holy Spirit to this infant that he may be born again and may be an heir of everlasting salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with thee in the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Now, the priest shall speak unto the God fathers and God mothers in this wise. Dearly beloved, you've brought this child here to be baptized. You've prayed that our Lord Jesus Christ would vouchsafe to receive him, to release him of his sins, to sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, to give him the kingdom of heaven and everlasting life. You've heard also that our Lord Jesus Christ has promised in his gospel to grant all these things that you have prayed for, which promise you for his part, which promise he for his part will most surely keep and perform. Wherefore, after this promise made by Christ, this infant must also faithfully for his part promise by you that are his sureties 
until he comes of age to take it upon himself, that he will renounce the devil and all his works and constantly believe God's words and obediently keep his commandments. I demand, where I ask you therefore, do you in the name of this child renounce the devil and all his works, the vain pomp and glory of the world with all covetous desires of the same and the carnal desires of this flesh so that thou will not follow nor be led by them? The godparents res uh, respond, I renounce them all. This goes back to the ancient practices of the church where you would turn to the West and, uh, and the priest would ask these questions to you and you would respond the same. Then you would turn to the East, to the setting of the sun, to the presence of Christ rising, the day spring from on high. And the priest would ask this question, dost thou believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus, his only begotten son, our Lord, and that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he went down into hell, and also did rise again the third day, that he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from thence he shall come again at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead. And thus thou believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the, rel the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and the life after death. So he recites the Apostles' Creed, and they say, All this I steadfastly believe. He then asks, Will thou be baptized into this faith? That is my desire. Will thou then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments, and walk in the same all the days of thy life? They then answer, I will. So what do you guys think of the confession before uh, before the great prayers? Think if I, what do you think? No. <laughs> um, I I really appreciate the confession. I think that does clarify a lot. I've been wanting to read more of Thomas Craner, but I, I Kramer, uh, I haven't been able to find some of his works yet for a reasonable price. Um, but that that does clarify some things because he does he does make that distinction and that categorical understanding between the two, and I think that's. I think that's very important. That was something that I was curious about, honestly, that I was still wanting to research because of the fact, like, growing up Roman Catholic, it, it really wasn't about that. They viewed it as when you're an infant, like, no, that completely washes you regardless of if you have your, actually have a faith or not, and then you just have to continue with confession and so on and so forth. All throughout the rest of your life, you know, you're put on the machine and you have to continue to go on the machine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it, exactly. It, it it made it made baptism mechanical and not something that's organic. Right. So that's, I mean, that, if that's that it does relieve a lot of my concerns because honestly, that was probably one of the major things that I love Anglicanism and that was one hurdle that I was just like, man, how am I going to get over this? Like how. How do I deal with this? Praise God. That's that's great to hear, brother. It what really baptism is. was baptism was your hurdle? Oh, oh it, I mean, it was a big one. Not saying that I rejected Anglicanism because of it, but it was a theological hurdle where I felt like I definitely struggled with. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. I mean, I'm 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 glad to, it's becoming a little bit more clear. I had to struggle a little bit too. Like I still do, in a, in a sense, but only in like understanding the mechanisms of it. Yeah. But uh. But um, I'm glad you can you you're seeing a little bit clearer. Yeah, and, and it's it's beautiful. Um, how one of the things that we've talked about this a lot is that the prayer book preaches, even in its praying, it preaches, it teaches theology. Um, this is why the prayer book has stood the test of time, because you learn by reading the prayer book. 
You learn by praying the prayers. You learn by being transformed by the theology that the <laughs> that the prayer book gives. Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief. So you learn what you believe by praying it. Like, this is this is why like the the rest of the the rest of the liturgy goes on to say. He says, then the priest shall say, "O merciful God." Grant, pray, grant that well this is these are called the grant prayers it's the litany for the child or for the baptism O merciful god grant that the old adam in this child may be so buried and that the new man may be raised up with him amen grant that all carnal affections may die in him and that all things belonging to the spirit may live and grow in him amen Grant that he may have power and strength to have victory and to triumph against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. Grant that whosoever is here dedicated to thee by our office and ministry may also be endued with heavenly virtues and everlastingly rewarded through thy mercy, O blessed Lord God, who dost live and govern all things, world without end. Amen. So here we, we again see the, the like a drumbeat what is the effects of baptism the old adam being buried the new man rising the carnal affections going away uh the the things belonging to the spirit uh growing uh, the seeds being planted there he being given power and strength to have victory against the devil um and 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 those watching receiving a blessing we receive blessings when we see god baptize his children like, I, I can't tell you how much of a blessing it is when I go to Christ Church Anglican and I see the children gathering around the baptismal font. When I see the priest and the family gather together around the font and the, and, and the priest baptizes the baby in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, I get something out of that. The Holy Spirit strengthens me where the, where the gospel preaches to me what that did. It happened to me also, and I'm being strengthened by that. I'm called to remember my own baptism, where through that, God calls me his child. I'm strengthened by that, and I'm reminded of the promises that God made to me and I made to God so that I might walk in his ways, so that I might walk down the path of righteousness, and so that one day, if I persevere, I will enter into the heavenly kingdom. That's the promise given to me at my baptism. That's the promise given to you. And that's what we pray for in the grant prayers. And then we see the, 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 the prayer given before the, uh, be, before the actual baptism itself. It says, Almighty and ever living God, whose most dearly beloved son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, did shed out of his most precious side both water and blood and gave commandment to his disciples that they should go and teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost regard we beseech thee the supplications of thy covet of thy congregation sanctify this water to the mystical washing away of sin and grant that this child now to be baptized in them may receive the fullness of thy grace and ever remain in the number of thy faithful and elect children through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So here we see the prayer given that God might sanctify water just as Christ did when he was baptized so that the Holy Spirit might work within it through these, through these means to wash away his sins, to receive them into the congregation and pray that he might receive the fullness of his grace so that he might always remain in the number of the faithful and elect children. And then as we see, the priest shall take the child into his hands. As Christ did with the children when he was alive and shall say to the godmothers, godfathers and godmothers, name this child. And then naming the child after them, he shall dip he shall dip the child into the water discreetly and warily. So carefully, this is the this is the means of baptism. It's sort of like a mix between immersion and pouring, to where the baby's head is in the water, 
a good amount in the water, but then water is poured over the child. He says, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, one, in the name of the Son, two, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, three. Then the priest shall say, we, the church, receive this child into the congregation of Christ's flock and do sign him with the sign of the cross in token that hereafter he shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world, and the devil and to continue as Christ's faithful soldier and servant until his life's end. Amen. And so what the priest does, he shall take some of the baptismal water and make a cross upon the child's forehead. Some of the ancient practices was also to put a cross on the child's chest as well. So what you were doing was you were, you were recognizing that God has received them into his church and he's made him a soldier of the king so that he might fight under God's banner. He's a soldier now. And he's recalled, he is called to live a life of one that is a servant of Christ until his life's end. So uh, what, do, what, do you, what do you guys think about this? Logos, what do you think? I think we should be Marines, not soldiers. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nerd. I think it's awesome. Like I, I got baptized when I was like 12 and I still remember it. Mm. Um, I was a little late. My, my parents kind of fumbled. That's but, okay. uh, yeah, I was, I was baptized with 12 and it's just like you telling that story just reminds me of my baptism because I really desired it to recall your uh, baptism. That's your strength. Nicholas. Can't relate. was baptized at like 23. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag let's go Navy, bro. So last week, <laughs> last week. <laughs> So, so here we come to the uh, to the big to the big statement, uh, the the Thanksgiving prayer, the big statement that we find in the Book of Common Prayer. Seeing now, dearly beloved brethren, that this child is regenerate, and grafted into the body of Christ Church, let us give thanks unto Almighty God for these benefits, and with one accord make our prayers unto Him that this child may lead the rest of this life according to this beginning. So what this text says is that through the baptism, by the work of the Holy Spirit, this child is regenerate, that he's put into the family of God, and that he's on the path. But it's not the end of the path. He's got to move. He's got to make a life for himself. He's got to take this for himself. And so in light of that realization, we pray along with the child, the all father, because he's been brought into our family. And the first things that we do as a member of our family is beseech our heavenly father together. We say, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Then the priest shall say, we yield thee hearty thanks, most merciful Father, that it has pleased you to regenerate this infant with your Holy Spirit, to receive him for thine own child by adoption, so he's adopted into the family of God, and to incorporate him into thy holy church. And we humbly beseech thee to grant that he being dead to sin and living unto righteousness and being buried with Christ in his death may crucify the old man. So he's, he, he's been counted as dead to sin and alive to righteousness, but now he must crucify the old man just as we must do and utterly abolish the whole body of sin. And that, as he is made a partaker of the death of thy son, he may also be a partaker of his resurrection. So that finally, with the residue of thy holy church, 
the residue of that holy church. Not all who are in the church are the elect of God. Not all who are of Israel, not all who are in Israel are of Israel. Not all who are baptized are the elect of God. Not all of them. Because those who are not elect don't persevere. Those who are elect persevere. This is why we pray that he might persevere. That he might also be a partaker of the resurrection. So that finally with the residue of thy holy church, he may be an inheritor of thine everlasting kingdom. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then all standing, the priest shall say to the godfathers and godmothers this exhortation, saying, For as much as this child has promised by you his sureties to renounce the devil and all his works, to believe in God and to serve him, ye must remember that it is your parts and duties to see that this infant be taught, so soon as he shall be able to learn what a solemn vow, promise, and profession he has made here by you. So he has made it, but he's made it by the congregation. And that he may know these things better, you shall call upon him to hear sermons. And chiefly, you shall provide that he might learn the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments in the common tongue, and all other things which a Christian ought to know and believe to his soul's health, and that this child may be virtuously brought up to lead a godly and Christian life, remembering always that baptism resents, represents to us our profession, which is to follow the example of our Savior Christ, and to be made like him, that as he died and rose again for us, so should we who are baptized die from sin and rise unto righteousness, continually mortifying all our evil and corrupt affections, and daily proceeding in an all virtuous uh, virtue and godly living. Then he shall add, you are also to take care that this child be brought to the bishop to be confirmed by him so soon as he can say the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, and be further instructed in the church's catechism set forth for that purpose. So, baptism is not the end. Confirmation is. Confirmation is the completion of baptism. After catechism, after instruction, confirmation is the end of our baptism. So, no baptism is complete until the child confesses the faith for himself. That seed is planted at baptism, but it does not fully grow into completion until faith is nurtured within the child himself, until he is able to confess it for his own. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. STS, what did you think? I dig it. Honestly, I, I love it. Whenever I hear those prayers read or I hear like the early Anglicans elaborate and just explain through the prayer, through the messages, like I just, I'm always awestruck. I really am. <laughs> Praise be to God. That's awesome, brother. That is awesome. We also Where's get Josh flipping when we need them. What? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. I sent, I sent this directly to him. <laughs> I sent this live directly to him, and he's not here. <laughs> you need to like. You should have said, just just said infused grace, and then went live. <laughs> you need to save this and then send it to him afterwards so he can listen to it. Oh yeah, like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be posting this on my YouTube. I haven't posted anything in a while, so I'm posting this on my Patreon and my YouTube. W, let's go. So, um, uh, the the rubric also says uh, it is certain by God's word that children which are baptized dying before they commit actual sin are undoubtedly saved. So it makes the question of, well, what happens if my child is baptized and they die in infancy? They're saved. They are, because we trust in God's promises. 
We promise that God said, we, we know that God said that he was going to do it. We promise that he will. That's it. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, we, if, if we have any more questions, please let them know in the comments. Um, our brother Gavin, who is also a, uh, a, a Brit, um, I don't think he's Anglican. I believe he's still Baptist. Um, I'm not really Baptist either, but yeah. Ah. So um, I have one question though, Jeremiah. You said something about the the child being regenerated in baptism. Sure. So my understanding my understanding of being regenerated is from life to death, and that is the saving act of being when you're regenerated. That's the saving act. So mm -hmm. I have no issue with baby baptism at all. So I'll state that right now. I have no issue with it. I, I used to a long time ago, but as I've grown up, I don't really have a issue. So how does that work then? If the child, what is the difference between a child being, re a baby being regenerated and, and somebody older like myself being regenerated? Um, really, there is no difference because the Anglicans define regeneration in a way that most 17th, 18th century reformed uh, do not. Salvation uh, and, and regeneration for Anglicans is the beginning of the Christian life. It's the beginning of the Christian life. You're replaced in God's covenant family. Your sins are forgiven, and the seed of the seed of God's graces and and the seed of sanctification and justification are placed within you. Um, and what you have to do is you have to have faith for that to grow, and that depends on God's prerogative in you, because you're you're objectively placed into God's covenant family. You're united to the tree, but you need life from that tree given to you. Because as we see in uh, passages like um, John 14, John 14 says, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch that does not have life is cut off from me. So these branches are connected to Christ. They're connected to Christ. They're, they're called, um, they're, they're said to be attached to Christ. They're said to be alive, but they don't have fruit because in reality, they're dead. The seed that is within them, that has been planted with them in their regeneration, in their baptism, has not, has not been born fruit. And that's because the Holy Spirit has not, has, has not converted them, has not fully converted them. So we, we look for and we pray for the salvific act of the Holy Spirit, and what, what, what Titus 3.5 calls the renewal of the Holy Spirit. There historically is a distinction between the what, what Titus 3.5 calls the washing of regeneration and then the renewal of the Holy Spirit. Those are two completely different things. They're related to one another, but they're, they're different things. So a person can be regenerated, but they there is a possibility for them not to be renewed. That actually makes sense within my own life, actually, then. So mm -hmm. I professed faith when I was about six years old, but mm -hmm. I haven't produced any fruit until three years ago when th what you're talking about is actually what happened. Right. So I get it now. That may, It all makes sense. Um, and yeah, that's cool. I get it. Thank you. That's just yep. clear for me. Jeremiah, I think you should clip that, what you just posted, because that was a really simple explanation and great. I sure. think you should post that. I think I think so, too. I'm, I'm definitely going to be posting this entire thing on YouTube and then making um, small clips from it. I'm probably standing because I've been sitting down for way too long. Um, so that would be the Holy Spirit, um, the, the seal that the Holy Spirit placed on me, for example, would be the three years ago. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, yeah, the full, the full seed taking fruit that happened three years ago for you, and you fully experienced it. Amen. Yeah, that, that, that clears up a lot for me. And yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Of course, brother. You know I'm always here to answer questions, man. Jaden, England, not submit to England. That's just wrong. <laughs> well, uh, not 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 specifically to the C of E right now. Some of some of them are kind of. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> submit to the to, to the American England. To the F C of E. 
the free church of england because i know some i know some really really good churches um on in the fc of e um brett murphy is uh, a really really great um uh, great priest over there uh he's been building this new church plant and um it's it's oh beautiful absolutely beautiful but uh yeah do you guys have any more um thoughts on the uh baptismal theology of the anglican formularies i think that does it for me awesome man I think you should start over. I didn't understand anything you said. Unfortunately, <laughs> right. I'm really stupid, so you're probably going to have to go over it again. I'm so sorry. Logos, we know you're old. You can turn your hearing aid up. It's okay. Right. right. <laughs> okay, Nick, just uh, break down what he said then. <laughs> Ooh. Do it. Do it, you jerk. <laughs> Baptize your babies. That's what he says. Woo! That's my boy. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, SPS said, Hey, Black Doctor, there's what's your opinion on the best route to go if there is no ACNA or RCA, REC churches nearby? Um, I would say probably look for a continuing Anglican parish. Um, uh, but if, if you don't have one, look for either a Lutheran or a Presbyterian church. Um, probably more Lutheran because they hold to the normative principle of worship and you'd be probably more comfortable there. Um, and STS said, baptize babies. I'm sold. Yes. I'm screenshotting this. And another one. I'm screenshotting it too. I'm screenshotting this. <laughs>